blessing and an honor to be out in the house of the Lord tonight. You all have been exceptionally well to me. You treated me wonderful, and I appreciate that. I love Brother Bud and Sister Peggy. I've enjoyed the services. Uh, the singings have been good. I like that power in the blood. You know, you can determine what kind of a person you are, what kind of a church you have, by how you sing power in the blood. You know that? You can figure out if you are city-fied and you say power. Or you can figure out if you're country-fied and you put them pears in the blood. And you all have it about in between. Amen? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. It is. The Lord has met with us, had He's promised to do that. I'm glad to know wherever two or three are gathered together in His name, He'll be in the midst. Amen? Amen. Take your Bibles, please. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 2 while you're finding your place. I want to thank the Gracers for being here tonight. I have missed these folks. And I am honored and privileged to pastor Grace Baptist Church. appreciate them for being here tonight. Love you guys and you guys. Hebrews chapter number 2. I want to begin reading in verse number 1 tonight. Hebrews chapter number 2, verse number 1. Now, as you find your place, let me say, the book of Hebrews is written to a scattered population of Jewish Christians who knew nothing at all about grace other than that they'd been saved by. They'd been redeemed. And they kept wanting to go back to the law. And can I tell you, it's hard to mix grace and law. Amen? And I thank God we're living in the dispensation of grace. We're living in the time of a church age. And the writer here is encouraging these people just to go on. Go on in Jesus. He's the better sacrifice. He's the better mediator. He's the better high priest. He's the author of a better covenant. And that's what you find all through the book of Hebrews. You find a book of encouragement to go on and to keep on keeping on and to really press toward the mark to be all you can be in Jesus because He's the greatest of the greatest, the highest of the highest, and the holiest of the holiest. And I'm glad to know that even though I'm not perfect right now, I can strive on to perfection and one day I will be perfect in a glorified body because of the God-man Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 2. I better read or I'm going to start preaching. Verse number 1, God's Word says this. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. For unto the angels hath He not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor. And it set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you that our hearts can be encouraged, that we can be all we can be in the excellency of your Son, Jesus. Now, Father, Lord, I know I have not always fought an excellent fight, but you've called me to an excellent fight. 
I've not always lived an excellent life, but I have that abundant life of excellence that I can experience and that I can live. Lord, help us to shift tonight from the mundane, from the status quo, from just the normal to that abundant life. Help us not just to survive, but help us to thrive. And Lord, remind us that we're salt of the earth and we're light of the world. And God, I pray that every one of us will grab a hold of your will tonight. And we'll say yes. And we'll do it all the days for the rest of our lives. I pray for this church. I pray, Lord, you'll send a great revival to our souls. Continue to fan the flame that's already been ignited in our heart so that it may spread and combust and continue to reach others. And I pray for Brother Bud and Sister Peggy and ask that you would bless them, Lord, as they leave here. No, oh God, I pray that souls will be saved because of the preaching of the Word of God. Now go with us, God, lead and direct us, hide me behind the cross, and use me tonight as your minister. For we ask these things in the strong and wonderful name of your Son, Jesus. And amen. amen. Here in Hebrews chapter number 2, we start off with the word, Therefore. And any time you read the word therefore, you have to stop and ask why it's therefore. And what therefore is, is it is something that ties together what has already been said with what is getting ready to be said. And so notice what the author says here. I believe it was Paul. Some will disagree with that. But I'll reference the author tonight as the Apostle Paul. He says, therefore we ought to give the more earnest he to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we would let them slip. I think it's interesting how the Holy Spirit is using him to strike the attention of the reader and of the listener of this letter. He didn't say we ought to just give heed. He said we ought to give earnest heed. And he just didn't say earnest heed. He said we ought to give the more earnest heed. What's he talking about? Well, obviously it's something very important. Amen. He has just told them something that is so important that's going to help them be able to do what He's told them they need to do in chapter 2. So in order for us to understand the context, and that is premium and necessary as students of the Bible, we've got to find the context unless we proof text. Amen? We've got to go back to chapter number 1. And he's saying, because of what I've told you in chapter number 1, because of what I've said to you, because of what you've read, you've got to hold on to these things. You've got to get a grip on these things. And that's what he's talking about. He says, don't let them slip. Do you believe we're living in a time where we are guilty of letting some things slip? Amen. You see, we've been given some very weighty and heavy and important doctrines and sometimes we just let them slip through our fingers. Sometimes we, we, we just let them go to the wayside. And sometimes uh, they'll go so long that we can mention these doctrines in church that come from the Bible, the preserved, inspired Word of God. And it's like nobody knows what we're talking about. It's because we've not held on to them. We have not endured sound doctrine. We have not earnestly contended for the faith. And that's important. That's what we need to do in these last days of the last days of this nasty now and now. We need to lift forward the bloodstained banner and go you therefore with the truths of the Word of God. Why? Because we are His church and the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Amen. I'm glad the church isn't going under. It's going up. Why? Because upon this rock I will build my church, Jesus said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What kind of rock was he talking about? He was talking about himself and the fact that he's God and he came and he bled and he suffered and he died and he rose again. Hey, the truths of the Word of God and the truth of Jesus and the glorious light of the Gospel will make a difference in this world. It will change lives and a salvage sinner's age. Amen. And so we got to get a grip on these things. We got to hold on tight. What's he talking about in chapter number one? Let's go back. Look at verse number one. God. That's an important way to begin a book, isn't it? God, capital G, capital O, capital D. Not Allah, not Buddha, but God. He's talking about the God of the Bible. He's talking about the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's talking about the God who spoke this world into existence.
existence by the power of his word. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken unto us by his son. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about eternal revelation. I want you to think about something tonight that maybe you've not thought about much before. What would you know about God if He had not chose to reveal Himself to you? What would you know about Jesus and His cross and His gospel? See, we wouldn't know the good news, would we? But God loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But also God chose to reveal Himself to us. He's revealed Himself to us all through the Old Testament, through the oracles of God, through the written Word of God. He's also revealed Himself to us through His Son. So we've got written revelation and we've got living revelation. And thank God the written revelation was given by the living revelation. Jesus, the law God, the eternal Word of God. And I'm telling you, we have the truth and we know what God is and who God is and what He expects and what He wants us to do and what He don't want us to do. Why? Because we know Him and the power of His resurrection intimately and personally. Why? Because He's chosen to reveal Himself unto us. I didn't wake up one day and go looking for God to try to find out who He was. No, He came to me. He sought me out. And brother, when I couldn't get to Him, He came to where I was. I like the song, Amen. And I'm glad to know that God so chose to show me who He was through His written Word, but also through His Son. You see, Jesus didn't come just to be an example. Jesus came to show us what God is. And God is a God who hates sin, but He loves sinners. And Jesus came to bear the weight of the sin of the world and die for it on the cross as the perfect, supreme, ultimate sacrifice and to rise again by the power of God so that men and women and boys and girls could be redeemed, could be salvaged, could be set free, could live. Hey, tonight if you're hungry, He's the living bread. If you're thirsty, He's He's the living water. If you're lost, friend, He's the one that points the way to the Father. If you're dead, He's the resurrection and the life. There's nobody like Jesus tonight, amen. amen. Oh, nobody like Jesus. And so He talks about eternal revelation. Verse number 2, He says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom He also made the world. He's talking about epic creation. Not only eternal revelation, but epic creation. You see, we'll never believe John 3.16. We'll never believe Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We'll never believe all these wonderful verses about salvation if we don't believe Genesis 1.1 and the rest of that chapter. See, I'm glad to know that God began this world. God spoke this world and framed this world by the power of His Word. And it was epic. It was His creation. We are His creation. Don't let that slip. Don't let epic creation slip. Don't let eternal revelation slip. And then you read the rest of chapter number 1 and He talks about the excellency of Christ. And friend, can I tell you, we can't make too much about Jesus. We can't preach too long about Jesus. We can't sing too much about Jesus. We can't teach too many lessons about Jesus. We cannot proclaim the name of Jesus enough in this lost and dying world, in this dark day in which we live. Friend, I want you to know it's about Jesus. It's in Him that we live and we move and we have our being. It's about Him in the church. He's to have preeminence in the church. It's about Him every day that we live where we work and what we do and how we do it. It's all about Christ. And the main thing is to what? Keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is the message of Jesus, the good news of the gospel. And so he encourages these Christians these Christians that don't know a lot about grace, these Christians that, that don't really understand yet how they're supposed to live and what they're supposed to do. He says, get a hold of this in chapter number 1. Don't let it slip. Get a good grip on it. You need to realize that God loves you so much He revealed Himself to you. You need to 
and realize there's a purpose. You were created by a divine purpose and you need to realize there's no one better and never can there ever be than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And once you get a hold of these things, then what should you do? So he commands them to get a grip. Verse number 2 of chapter number 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation. So he's telling you, if you let these things slip, and you don't get a grip, judgment day's coming. Amen? Now, I know that's not a message anybody wants to hear, but that's a Bible message, amen? The Bible says it's appointed once unto man to die, and after this, the judgment. And I'm telling you, there's going to be a judgment for the saved, and there's going to be a judgment for the lost. Praise His holy name that I will not be judged at that great white throne judgment, brother bud. I'll be a witness. I'll be there and sing of the great judge. Judge those that's rejected Him as He cast all into the lake of fire from hell. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a judgment for believers much, much earlier than that. And the Bible says that when the trump of God sounds, we're going to be called up in the air. And our bodies are going to be changed. And it's going to take place in the moment of the twinkle of an eye. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Guess what's going to happen right then? We're going to be judged. And it's not a judgment of sin. You know why? Because my sin was judged to Jesus on the cross more than 2,000 years ago. And I am justified. You know what that means? That means just like I never sinned. I can stand before God one day just like I've never sinned and just like I never even had a sinful nature, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because I have exchanged my sin for His righteousness. I've done that by faith when He saved me. What an exchange. And then He makes this piercing statement. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So he first tells us to get a grip, and now he's telling us you've got to grow. Amen? Get a grip, but then you've got to grow. Now here's the way a lot of preachers preach this passage of Scripture. If you don't get saved or not, you neglect salvation, you're going to die. And you're going to burn in hell. Now you can do that if you want to. You hear them say, oh, if you put off salvation too long, you've neglected. But really, that's rejection, isn't it? Right. You see, he's not talking to lost people, he's talking to saved people. So there is a possibility for saved people to neglect not just salvation, not just great salvation, but so great a salvation. Can you say amen to that? Isn't it a great thing to have so great a salvation? Hey friend, if you've been saved any length of time, you can say amen, amen, Brother Reggie. I know it's so great a salvation. Hey, it's great in its preparation. Why? Because God planned it and Jesus purchased it and the Holy Spirit presents it. Amen. The Holy Spirit is knocking on your heart's door. If you're lost or not saying the preacher is telling you the truth and Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And yes, He did die on the cross of Calvary. And yes, did God love you so much that He allowed Jesus to do that. He allowed the plan of God to be brought to this earth by Jesus so that you could have redemption. It's great in its preparation but it's also great in its price. I'm telling you in His body He bore our sin and with His blood He has blotted out our sin and He had a victorious, visible bodily resurrection. Yes, it's great in its preparation but it's also great in its price. It costs God everything that he had. A seraphim or a cherubim didn't die for me or you. Michael or Gabriel didn't die for me and you. Wasn't Moses or Abraham or David or Solomon? No, friend. It was God's only begotten Son that He gave for you, and it cost them the price of His life and the price of His blood. Amen. It's so great a salvation because of its prospect 
See, Zacchaeus was a crook and he got converted, didn't he? Saul was a murderer and God changed him from a church-hating murderer to a church-planning missionary. You remember Legion in Mark chapter number 5, demon-possessed, and God saved him radically, dramatically, instantaneously, and eternally. You remember Nicodemus in John chapter number 3, religious as he could be, but also as lost as he could be. And he came to Jesus and he said, listen, we know the power to teach or come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest uh, except God be with him and Jesus cut right to the chase didn't he and he said verily verily I say unto thee ye must be born again and Nicodemus got it didn't he he hid it for a while but he got it thank the Lord Amen. it's a great salvation it's great in its power it's transforming power see it's the difference between heaven and hell it's the difference between light and darkness it's the difference between lost and saved it's the difference between the Holy Spirit controlling me and Satan controlling me. It's great in its power, but it's also great in its provision. It's eternal. It's everlasting. It's abundant. And it's great in its plan. Listen, salvation is not hard. All you got to do is put your trust in Jesus and Jesus will save your soul. Yeah, that's right. Thank God for salvation tonight. Amen. Listen, every one of you ought to thank God that you heard the truth and you didn't have to come out of a cult to find the truth. Amen? Amen. You didn't have to spend 35 years in the watchtower and get all that stuff out of your head before the truth could come into your head. You ought to praise the Lord tonight for salvation full and free through the provision of the cross and the very heart of God. But we can neglect it. We can neglect it. Let me ask you a question. Did Brother Bud get in trouble for neglecting my children? No, he can't. But I can. Because they're mine. So he's talking about people that's got the gift of God. You see, here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that good people that come to church every time the doors are open, and they try to read their Bible every day. And they even have somewhat of a consistent prayer life. Can still be guilty of neglecting their salvation. Think of all the benefits that comes along with your salvation. You know what we do sometimes? We, we get this uncontent mentality. And listen, Paul said that in every situation and everything that we should be content in Jesus. And he didn't write that from an island laying on a sandy beach shore getting a suntan and drinking a big cold bottle of water, did he? <laughs> Sipping on some sweet tea. No, he wrote that from the inner prison of a jail cell. And here's what we do so many times. We'll say, oh, if I could just get that promotion, then I'd be happy. If I could just get that woman or that man in my life, then I'd be happy. If I could just get that new car or that new shotgun rifle or a four-wheel drive, then I'd be happy. And you know what? You're going to get that new shotgun and it's not going to make you happy. And you're going to get two or three more and it ain't going to make you happy. And you're going to get that new bass boat and it ain't going to make you happy. And ain't nothing going to make you happy until you learn how to be content with the salvation God's given you and who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. A million dollar check in the mail will not give you joy in your heart. It can make you happy for a day. It can give you satisfaction for a month. But can I tell you, friend, there's a difference between joy and happiness. And so many times we get give away our joy and we forfeit our peace because we're always living in some destination in the future instead of living for Christ in the here and in the now. Tell me I ain't telling you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I know people that lose their joy if Kentucky don't make it to the final four. Give me a break. <laughs> I like them as much as you do, but listen, it ain't going to 
change my day. It, it ain't going to cause me to lose sleep at night. It ain't got nothing to do with my Savior. He's on the throne and He's in control. And can I tell you what He's done in my heart? No one can reverse it. No principality or power, not even the devil himself, can do anything about it. And we begin to get discontent with where we're at and what's going on. I looked at my wife several times and I thought, man, if we could just get us a place. And I said, sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. I know you've got us a place. You've got us a place. I've got to be content where I'm at right now in you or I will not be content in you when I get to that place. Amen. Amen. And you know, when we get discontent, we get very unthankful. And instead of saying, oh, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to go through this trial and obstacle, we say, why did you allow me to do that? Why did you allow this to come to my life? Lord, you know I go to church and you know I read in my Bible. You know I tell my neighbors about Jesus. But, but Lord, I'm doing everything I can. And it seems like this is unjust. It seems like that this shouldn't be happening to me. And I, I don't understand why I have all these trials and tribulations. But my neighbor... My neighbor don't ever darken the door of your house. He, he denies your very existence, but it seems like everything's going good in his life. And he's got more money in the bank account than I do, and he's got a newer truck than I do. And it seems like all of his troubles is it's not my troubles. Oh, God, I don't understand. See, the devil's got a way of deceiving us. you got something in your heart that he don't have and might not ever have unless you stop neglecting your salvation and share it with him. Amen we get discontent then we become unthankful and then you know what happens we get discouraged we get so discouraged that we can come to church and the word of God doesn't bless us anymore we can hear the songs of Zion and they don't stir our hearts anymore God can show us something from his word and don't even change our life or excite us anymore if we're not very careful we can neglect our salvation and then if that happens guess what we're not going to grow and if we're not growing the way we should, we cannot glow as lights in this world the way that God wants us to. Yeah. Now, I would have rather bragged on Jesus tonight and rode off into the sunset, but this is the message. I dare say that preachers have been guilty of neglecting their salvation. There was a BMX bike that I just had to have. <laughs> oh, I wanted it so bad for the bud. I said, Daddy, there is the coolest BMX bike over at Hills Department Store in Lexington. Right there on New Circle Road. I said, come on, let's go look at it, Daddy. And he said, let's go look at it. I went and I showed it to him. Told him all about it. He memorized parts of the specifications on that thing because I just had to have that bicycle. He said, looks like a good one. Let's go. Get in the car. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm going to get A's on my report card. That very seldom happened. And I studied and I studied and I tried to be the best little student that I could. And I done everything the teacher told me to do. And I even done extra than what she told me to do. And that report card had come home and all A's. First time that ever happened. No one in Evan much higher standard for you than me. <laughs> you don't do as I do. You do as I say. Amen. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'm going to get that bicycle. Uh -uh, I'm going to get it. And I said, Dad, i got all A's on my report card. He said, it's about time. You've done it once now. We know you can do it. Keep it up. <laughs> and I said, boy, Dad, I, I, I sure would like to go back over heels and look at that bicycle. Well, let's go look at it. <laughs> we went and looked at it again and come back without it. <laughs> and I was just in torture, and I had to have this bicycle, and I wanted it so bad. About a week later, I sat sitting there, and Mom was a bragging on me. He's been cleaning his room. He's been taking out the trash. And he's mowed the yard, and he's even managed to weed eat without killing my flowers. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard her. She said, you ought to take him and get him that bike. I didn't know she set me up. <laughs> and I said, Daddy, I really would like to go get that bike. He said, go get the truck. I remember I run so hard to that truck. This is a little old boy. 
And I got in that old red GMC truck and shut the door. And there he come, Mike, and he leaned up against it, and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing exactly what you told me to do, sir. <laughs> because I want to go get that bike. And he said, did you not see what you should have seen? I said, did I not see what, sir? He said, look right over there. And there it was. Oh, 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 it's, woo! I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> what do you say, Jim? Oh, Brother Bud, I'm so, so thankful for that bike. Yeah. And there it sat. And I hugged him so tight, and I hugged Mama so tight. And I got on that bike, and I rode it, and I rode it, and I rode it. And I went to every one of my buddies' houses, Mike, up and down, Eden Court in Lexington, Kentucky. What do you want? Supper is over. I got a new bike. Come look at my BMX bike. And man, I was showing off on that bike. Let me ride. You ain't riding my bike. Get your own bike. I take off. Go to the next friend's house. And about two weeks later, Daddy come in and it was sitting out in the rain. He said, son, you remember how bad you wanted that bike? You remember that bike you just had to have? Get it in the garage. It's going to rust. I said, oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry, Daddy. I, I didn't know it was out in the rain. About two weeks later, it went from me leaving it out to the rain to where I just pull it up right into the driveway and lay it in the middle of the driveway. Never even my daddy come home with that old dump truck. He'd have to stop that dump truck and get out and move that bike and then get back in that dump truck and pull it into the driveway. Cars backed up down the road, horns a blaring, people let him know that he was number one in a very un good way. Right? He said, Reggie, he said, I don't understand this. You wanted that bike. You had to have that bike. And you've went to leaving it out in the rain, and now you're leaving it in the driveway. And I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not stopping this dump truck anymore and picking your bike. The next time I come in and I find that bicycle in that driveway, I will run over it in this dump truck. Yes, sir. I put it up. Do you know what's interesting how quickly we forget when we're kids? Interesting how quickly we also still forget when we're adults. And I heard that dump truck coming in one day, and I heard him downshifted. Oh, and it was just such a vivid memory. I didn't mean for it to happen. I just meant to run into the house to grab something, but I got interested in something else. And I didn't mean for it to happen. I didn't want it to happen. It just happened. And I heard, crunch, crunch. And he ran over. Now some of y'all were thinking, that's the meanest daddy in the world, but can I tell you that's the greatest lesson that he ever taught me in my life. Yeah. And he didn't go and buy me another bicycle. I had to mow yards. I had to rake leaves to earn my bicycle. And through that whole lesson, I was taught the cost of things and the responsibility I had to take care of such a great gift. Amen? Yeah. And some of us have been given far greater things than a BMX bicycle. We've been given a marriage and we're neglecting it. We've been given children and we're neglecting them. We've been given membership in a local New Testament Baptist church and we don't take it as serious as we should. We've been given a ministry. The ministry of reconciliation where we tell people Jesus can save you by His rich royal crimson blood and we very seldom ever tell anybody about that. But then it gets down to a personal level, doesn't it? To where we even begin to neglect our own salvation. And friend, can I tell you, that's not what God wants us to do. And so tonight, how do you know if you've been neglecting your salvation. Well, here's one way to know. If the things of God don't mean as much to you now as they once did in the past, you've neglected your salvation. If you're not as serious about Bible reading and Bible study as you once had been, you have neglected your salvation. When you wake up of a morning, if there's anything fighting for first place in your heart, Besides Jesus, you could be in danger of neglecting 
your salvation. And so listen, we need to get a grip. Yes, amen, amen. Get a grip, get a grip, get a grip. That's the verse we all amen. But then we've got to grow. Do you know if this church is going to be what it needs to be, every one of us are members of the body in particular, and we've got to do what God has called us to do. And if one of us decides, well, we're going to take a day off, that's going to lead to a week off. It could lead to a month off. It could lead to the rest of our life off. And I promise you, friend, it will affect your family. It will affect Brother Bud and Sister Peggy. It will affect this New Testament church. And it's high time we take this thing called Christianity more serious than we take anything else in our life. You see, what some of us have forgotten is that we're not called and placed on this earth to sell fish and tackle. We're called and placed on this earth to be a representative of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And if He gives us an opportunity to sell fish and tackle, then we use that as a platform to share Jesus. Oh, friend, tonight I hope this message strikes you in the heart. I hope it rings true. I hope right now the Holy Spirit is showing you exactly where you need to tune up and recommit. See, that's what revival's about. Now listen, because we can neglect our salvation doesn't mean we should. And if you have neglected your salvation, it's not the end of the world. Jesus is gracious. Praise His holy name. And Jesus is so good at taking your past faults and your failures and your mishaps and your mess-ups and putting His grace to them and His power and forgiving you. And He can take your mess through time and make a message out of it, can't He? And He can make the rest of your life the best of your life. So just because you might be guilty of neglecting your salvation, making light of it, not taking it as serious as you should, doesn't mean that you're trapped into that. Doesn't mean that you've resigned to that. Doesn't mean that it's over. No, friend, tomorrow's going to be a new day. And I'm telling you, weeping may come in the night, but joy is going to come in the morning. And He's not the God of the past. He's the God of the present. He is the I Am. We don't have a past him Savior. We have a present tense Lord. And even though you've messed up and I've messed up and we're not perfect, He can make a difference. Amen. So tonight all you got to do is just be honest with Him. Yeah. Say, God, I need your help. I need your help. And Jesus to help you on me. Oh, let's not do our salvation like i done that BMX bicycle. Let's not do our salvation like we have let other things slip. Tonight, as we walk out those doors, that sign up there is true. You are entering your mission field. Take it serious. I don't think we've got much longer. I really don't. I'm not trying to say today because the Bible says no man knows. No man knows the hour or the time, but I tell you this. I want to go out finishing my course. I want to go out running my race well. I want to go out fighting a good fight. Stand to your feet. Father Lord, thank you.